Okay. Um, yeah, thanks uh, again, uh, Nathan, Petar, and everyone for, I'll speak up a bit, for, for having me back, albeit in a sort of more distracting location. Um, but I'll just sort of um, dive right in. I think that the stakes of this and the relation of this, this research and project to the, the theme of, of structure, but also I think more protect, particularly for me, the, the question of historical structure and sort of structuration, how abstract forms come to work on and through particular activities um, bodies and media, I think, will become evident. So, I'll start with um, epigraph um, from, from Thomas Brown um, in 1643. Natura nihil agit frustra, nature does nothing in vain, is the only indisputable axiom in philosophy. There are no grotesques in nature. Okay, in Francis Connolly's book, um, The Grotesque in Western Art and Culture from 2012, one of the more recent uh, of the recurrent attempts to define the grotesque, this seems to happen every so often. She fabricates an encounter with an unruly TV to clarify just what does and does not fall beneath the term. Quote, aberration, combination, and metamorphosis represent the visual attributes of the grotesque, but they are not sufficient in themselves to make an image grotesque. For example, interference might scramble our television signal and with it the familiar features of a news anchor. But this moment of ambiguity is not in itself grotesque. It would turn grotesque, however, if this intermittent and partial image of the familiar face suddenly began to bark and snarl, merging with another alien reality. Uh, Cronkite plus medieval tapestries, end quote. On first glance, this appears an adequately sharp account of a blurry process. Moments of ambiguity or temporary lags in clarity indeed cannot be grotesque because otherwise, simply enough, structures of perception, um, excuse me, uh, moments of ambiguity, temporary lags, and clarity indeed cannot be grotesque because structures of perception must grant room for them. Otherwise, every fog would be terrifying, as would be the daily fact that even decent peripheral vision can scarcely compensate for the permanent blindness of our skull's rear-facing halves. We cannot see all, yet we go on. Instead, grotesque in her example marks this co-presence of what should be mutually exclusive, right? One face as opposed to another face, or a news report as opposed to enraged canine noises. So the grotesque for Connolly and many others before her names that impossible conjunction of discrete categories, a breakdown of or crisis within the relation of conceptual and material order, most visibly in the loss or blurring of a single being's coherence. Um, which is to say that hers, like most theories of the grotesque, I'd say hinge on a certain hylomorphism and crisis, marking the coming apart of a form and the substance whose limits an internal organization that allegedly informs. Um, it's a model, basically, that she's adopting of what Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, probably the most influential um, theorist of the grotesque, calls a body and becoming. Something has come unstuck from its ontic mooring and is glimpsed midway through a process of metamorphosis, the end of which remains uncertain. Canine might be the other side of the interval, but who's to say we stop at dog, right? Okay, this seems a sort of promising way in, especially towards the political stakes that often accompany accounts the grotesque as a apparently radical mode, which I'll sort of detail shortly. But I think two serious and sort of damning limitations emerge when we give a second glance to the conceptual structures underlying both Connolly's particular point and more generally the majority of the last three centuries worth of thinking about the grotesque. I'm gonna argue that I think it's basically all wrong. Um, so first, the stress is laid wholly on that image itself as it falls within a delimited zone, the screen, where the grotesque can happen and be identified. And as a result, such an approach cannot grasp this image as the product of a dense network of techniques, forces, and hidden labors that make it appear. Um, for instance, it cannot move from the mica dust in the makeup of the face of the anchor that reflects light back to the cameras to those who operate them, from the glass of the screen to the metals dug to be made into satellites off which the signal reflects back to the dish on the roof of the house where that static-ridden TV waits and perhaps barks from time to time. Which is to say, thinking the grotesque in this way that Connolly suggests bars us from sketching any diagram, cogent and or paranoid, of the tangle of social and material forms, of the interference and waste that it once impels, yet is forged by these processes of construction and circulation. Instead, her grotesque image just happens to be, confirming its own autonomy as the site of a vital and self-same force endlessly itching to metamorphose and woof. And if the grotesque is to happen, it will do so only and ever as miracle, an alien content appearing in a quotidian yet unexamined box. Second, 
and give Kronka a happier vegetal um, interpenetration. Second, even within that bounded image itself, Connolly's theory restricts the categorical slippage of the grotesque to designating only that content only that transition between objects, and specifically between living beings, right? From a human anchor to a doggish something. The juncture point smoothed by an all-encompassing vitality. And I'd note here um, as well that what pushes the image into the terrain of the grotesque for her, specifically what kind of marks it, is that sense uh, of animal to animal transference, right? With the sense of, depending on your perspective, either a desubjectivation or an amplification of subjective possibility by transferring across vital forms. Uh, and this restriction to metamorph of metamorphosis to essentially like a zoological drift and eruption is central to what the grotesque becomes. But this restriction cuts from this scene a second and frankly much more disarming, if not horrifying, process in which a discrete being like a human reporter does not transition into an other vital being or even other material object, but instead loses coherent identity without resolving into a recognizable other. One would imagine Ann Coulter swallowed by the green screen, sort of atomizing into, which would actually be beautiful, uh, and, but right, this possibility is cut from the ground. But in standard accounts of the grotesque, such as Connolly's, that possibility goes missing in full. And so if, as she writes, quote, the grotesque is that smudge intermixing discrete identities and boundaries, making a veritable creative bonfire, end quote, the bonfire that she, like almost all thinkers of the grotesque in the last few hundred years, will sketch is a tightly managed burn. It never intermixes structures of articulation with their materials, but slips only between perceived objects of the same broad category. So the basic point of this talk and, and the research it presents, albeit a, a very briefly, I fear, um, is to ask after that past over structural interference and to insist contra Connolly and almost all other theorists, with a few weird exceptions from the 15th century, that this interference too is grotesque and that it snarls with a ferocity and precision beyond what any sort of Cronkite Corgi hybrid has or could or will muster. And I think the stakes of this are higher than a, a quibble with those theorists. Um, hopefully, because not the grotesque on its own terms, but rather the drift of the grotesque's meaning across time opens towards the difficult but necessary understanding of how it is that historical forces work on and through discrete beings and activities, how they bend their forms in accordance with abstractions that can be seen only in their effects, and how it is that historically contingent structures aim to persist across time and declare themselves natural. So, of course, given my predilections, we'll also wind our way through no small quantity of hybrid beast and animated hunks of architecture wrestling with each other. Um, we'll, we can start with some of those. Um, but more particularly, the talk will sort of follow three paths, sort of interwoven rather than sequentially. One, as I mentioned, is to delineate the, the history of the consolidation of the grotesque from its original meaning into the narrowed form visible in Connolly's and Bakhtin's and Kaiser's and Harpem's and all these others in their work. And that narrative form is what I'm going to talk about as the figurative grotesque, um, as opposed to a sort of relative grotesque. I'll walk through this. Second, though, is to mark the political um, stakes and motivations of that shift, which I want to pause for a moment to clarify, because I think in a way, for me, the backdrop of this whole kind of project is a sense of how the grotesque has come to be mobilized as apparently transgressive and hence often assumedly radical form of disrupting norms, right? Often through a focus on that which seems to flaunt them or resist their containment. Um, I think there's a sort of couple uh, variants we could, we could think of this. One would be a sort of Bakhtinian one. I think Schneeman's performance like Meet Joy is indicative of this, where you get that Saturnalian inversion, obscene laughter, the sense of reinvigoration of kind of anarchic folk knowledge and the sort of uncontainable body. Um, we could also think of recent films like Alexei German's Remarkable Hard to Be a God, but also directors like Lina Wertmuller, um, Pasolini, entire swaths of Russian literary production, uh, Ferde Durke, etc., Julia Bardsley's Form. I mean, going fast with these, but one could endlessly walk through some of these examples. This is sort of one modality. It's sort of concerned with that like public obscene body. Um, I think George Gross as well, but Gross also kind of pivots to a secondary concern, which is specifically on the bodily grotesque, at once horrific, comic, visceral, and eviscerating, leaking, and fundamentally queer. Um, I think along with figures like Gross, I would think of the way in which Kara Walker uses the figure of kind of metamorphosis to uh, investigate kind of racial terror under the lens of the grotesque. Uh, Oliver Lerick, I'm much less interested in than Walker, but has sort of made this a sort of stock and trade. We could also think of people like um, Schlingensief, um, Toshio Matsumoto, 
Um, so I have your Ottman um, Demons, Kembra Faller, I think some of my Kelly's work might fall in this sort of orbit as well there. Um, and probably most infamously or fittingly Shinya Tsukamoto's Tetsuo Iron Man, one of the remarkable mechanomorphic works of kind of grotesque uh, image making here. And in this case, um, I would also include a ton of kind of horror, a good half of the horror genre, let's say particularly a, a sort of body horror form and I think is often rightly linked to forms of queer epistemology and questions about undoing the sort of clarity of the divide between human and non-human animals. Um, and in this case, the, the politics, the assumed radical quality has to do with the transgression of norms, the making apparent that the categories which define bodies are always performative con constructions, but they're also never complete, right? So they're porous and open for revision, right? That would be a sort of key sense of that. Um, oh, I put this in here just because you were talking about it. There's an amazing way where I think this scene, what struck me as you were saying, um, is that there's a way where, I mean, because this is a horror film, right? Um, Def Modern Times is totally a horror film. And what's remarkable about this is what he essentially gets caught in is a projector. There's a way in which Chaplin himself is like a frame of film, kind of riveted and torn through this apparatus and at the other end of which he's now animated. There's a sort of inhuman vitality that's been transferred to him through the machine, at which point he is now machinic. So this might be a nice form of the kind of proto-cyborg uh, version of a kind of mechanomorphic grotesque that I really love. Okay, but another variant that I think is especially key, and I think sometimes gets less attention in, at least let's say like a, a kind of an American idiom, although people use it all the time, would be the kind of thing you get in something like um, Luigi Chiarelli's um, the, the Mask in the Face, uh, 1913 play foundational for this sort of construction of a kind of theater of grotesque. This is really interesting. This is a 1941 illustration that borrows that title, this Giovanni Costretti work, and it's a recto verso. So in the front, right, you've got this sort of face and you flip around that. Um, and tellingly what happens within this is that even though um, Chiarelli will kind of be working in theater, the conception of the grotesque itself is essentially theatrical even beyond that. It's predicated on the fantasy of role playing on the gap between the sort of smooth face of power that attempts to sort of consolidate the civic around it and everything that gets in the way, that sort of surging nastiness. So um, for me, um, very important filmmakers, including this piece in like Elio Petri's work, um, I also think a lot of stuff in the broader orbits of sort of Czech New Wave would be really key, like um, Jorge Herz, The Cremator, um, and then Nigel Farage. Um, and the reason I'm raising this is that I think that this third mode of the supposedly radical grotesque um, tends to be marked by a certain sense where even if we associate it with deeply pejorative figures who should be purged from the face of the earth, like Farage, like Trump, like the others, um, there's the sense that the work of exposing it is somehow a progressive, if not, if not radical task, right? You've exposed the mask of power, the senility of the sovereign, the seething rot behind the tan, right? Um, and when it comes to Trump and his ilk, you can very quickly see the, the limits of this. This is another fitting one of Giuliani's monstrosity. Uh, and then this, which I'll just leave up while I say this, um, a potent image in some ways. Uh, but when it comes to sort of the, the kind of Trumpian moment and a liberal fixation on it, you can quickly see the limits, as powerful as this may be, um, as it often tends to retrograde forms of homophobic panic, like images of him kissing Putin, right? Or forms of sort of fat shaming, or the sense that his like unique morning bout of linguistic linguistic diarrhea significantly changes structures of power and domination in the US, right? The fantasy that, ah, if you reveal the obscenity, then the mask will be off, right? There was no mask. Um, OK, I'll leave this to a nicely medieval sort of anticipation. But the visual rhyme seems fitting. Only because I know no one will focus if I leave this other image up. Um, what I want to get at, though, through this, um, as much as I think a lot of these are really important, particularly uh, in instances that have, that have looked at a sort of uh, a queer redefinition of corporal experience and the sort of sociality of that. Um, what I want to get at is I think are actually the real limits of those theories and understandings of the grotesque insofar as they ultimately confirm the very frame and form they claim to wish to trouble. That of the sort of individual body and thereby the grounding unit of the citizen. And to show how this comes to be, it's a big claim. Um, hopefully people will be along with it, but um, we'll give it a try. We have to go back to the roots the grotesque in order to also find the branching chance not taken, which is maybe the sort of third task of this talk if I get there, which is to suggest what were and are the stakes of other modes of recombination, interference, and determination once carried by an inchoate kind of field, a sort of energized field named grotesque. 
And, and by this branching path, I mean specifically their capacity to think subsumption, uh, a key kind of category in Marxist theory, the one I think that often remains obscure. And by this, I mean the subsumption of discrete lives, forms, and processes, not to a trans-historical abstraction, but to abstractions that themselves cannot be separated from a sort of lurching drift of capital and accumulation. So I'll try to get there. So let's go back. Um, appropriately, for the idea, the grotesque lacks any clean point of origin in one regard, um, but the reason for that is split. Because on the one hand, you can say, uh, even if at the end of the 15th century in Rome, the word grotesque is used for the first time in this way, as it is, and I'll explain, all the same, the major elements of what it named, or some of them, were long play, right? Folk tales, epics, myths from around the world all share obsessions with the shapeshifter, the slippery being, the caught between, right? The Tengu, the Berserker, the Nawal, the Aswang, the Spriggan, the Ala. These are, this is not unique to a sort of Western European or Central Western European construction. And even in the more delimited sphere of decorative arts and territories once part of the Roman Empire, there are medieval manuscripts, like these are from um, rife with what would kind of retroactively be called grotesque. They run rampant with these polymorphous flatulent hybrids and a stew of kind of recombinatory gonads that lean into the scripture. Uh, I'm sure people have seen many of these. They're fantastic. And in the same years, um, a graphic organization of wall space uh, influenced by lost sources of the grotesque to be were still showing up in European churches like the El Meland Kirke. And more importantly even that, there are those concatenating geometric botanical tangles that from the 8th century on formed a crux of Islamic decorative art and would come to be deemed in Europe as arabesque um, by the 18th century, particularly in France, used almost interchangeably with grotesque, incorporating its form of acanthian patterning and vegetal abstraction, uh, the kind of thing that Wilhelm Voringer would go nuts over, um, as the concept of grotesque comes loose from decoration. So what I'm saying is that in one regard, to name the grotesque as starting at some point is quite odd. It seems to be a sort of, if not primordial, but a sort of constant obsession and tension within sort of human societies around the world, including where it emerges as a concept. On the other hand, the term grotesque does emerge at a really specific moment. Um, in the years around 1480, when a young Roman man goes underground, quite literally, uh, this is true, he falls through the crust of the Equiline Hills and into the darkness of the cavern, this oldest horror gag in the book. And what he falls into is this, which are the decorated rooms of Nero's opulent Domus Aurea, um, a palace that was built in the center of Rome more than 1400 years before, after the great fire of 64 CE had suspiciously cleared the ground for both it and Nero's new urban development plan alike. Sort of a quite useful fire. Um, and shortly after his death, Embera's successors were eager to avoid appearing in the lineage of the loath predecessor. Um, and so they heaped dirt over the palace. They literally just covered it over and acted like it had never happened. Uh, in so doing, they also covered over the primary examples of the third kind, uh, excuse me, the kind of what's called third period Roman painting that covered its walls. Pompeii, for instance, where you get more of this style, wasn't excavated until 1748. Um, so the palace remained staying out of sight until this fortuitous tumble towards the end of the 15th century, then leads artists to spelunk the lost pa palace grotesquely. That's to say, as if it were a system of grottos, as if a tomb or cave. So this is the sort of origin of the word. It has to do with the mode of investigating these caves, right? Um, and there they find this style of painting, which is new to the artists of the Italian Renaissance, waiting out of sight. And what's interesting, um, I'll sort of come back to the, the instances. Well, let me just leap ahead to quickly show you this um, before I double back, is that what they do essentially is they, they literally will copy elements from it and bring into things like the Vatican Loggia. It's a direct like copying of the patterns and then letting them loose on the surface to kind of proliferate across Europe. Okay, so let me go back to the, the examples here. And this is gonna be a bit like formalist and technical, but I hope it's worth it. Um, what is this kind of painting that comes to be called grotesco, grotesque? Okay, in the form found in the Domus Aurea and subsequently reproduced, it involves a complex system of design with interlocking, axial, and sub... Oh, the color's not great. It's a lot pinker. It's kind of a hot, neon-y, sort of weird um, vibe, but imagine that. Um, 
So it involves a complex system of design, as you can see, with interlocking axial and subdivided space, as if a set of many screens, within which are arrayed figures, plants, objects, architectural junk, and decorative elements. And all these tend to be linked not as whole scenes, as you can see, but, um, excuse me, not as whole scenes set in a total space we'd recognize as like landscape or tableau, but rather they're sort of floating and joined together quite delicately, often as themselves hybrid assemblages that form the very loose shapes that divide the space, which is really key for me and an interesting thing, rather than there being secondary sort of dividing materials, often the kind of grotesque combinations themselves form the dividing lines, right? So I think you can see this in sort of three ways, uh, particularly looking towards a sense of giving image to subsumption, giving image to sort of falling beneath a pattern that eclipses you. Okay, so first, I'll just maybe I'll walk through a couple more so you can sort of see some, some in cuts to these. Um, as you can see, right, these sort of flourishes there have masks and birds and sort of variant other elements. So first, there's a blur. I'll go one more here. Um, let me do this one. Okay, well, no, we'll, I'll, I'll remain on this because this allows you to see up close before we go to the others. Okay, so first, there's a blur internal to the figurative material itself, to the animals, the humans, the plants, objects, the building hunks. There are little remarkable the human torsos sprouted from vases, the tails of winged dragons that curl continuously into the bodies of swans, rearing horses that extend out the bottom flanges of candelabra. And so in terms of what comes to be called grotesque, right, this is the most familiar. Like the things themselves, you're like, oh, that's a grotesque dragon table boy fire. Like, okay, sure, that's grotesque. Um, but crucially, this is only one of the kinds of blurring at work. And this is going to kind of what, what gets lost. Because second, there's a blurring between those figurative marks, that potentially shape-shifty content, and the lines, curves, and repeating patterns that don't represent a thing per se. There's, this is a blurring based between the figurative and the ornamental. Depicted beings and objects bleed into invented patterns and vice versa. Vases become flourishes, birds become shafts, boys become curls. Placed in a narrative situation, this would be something like a werewolf film where on the full moon, the protagonist didn't turn into a wolf, but just a sort of spiraling spray of color that hangs in the night air. The sort of errata in a world of weight um, clearly goes missing. And third, there's blurring between two different statuses of those independent marks. And, and independent, I mean both the figurative and the ornamental. So on the one hand, there are elements, um, this is maybe a good instance for this, there are elements that command their own attention, right? That might be singular and unexchangeable, like that bird, that red curve. It's something to kind of look at in its specificity. But there are also generic visual materials whose placement is dictated by a compositional structure far bigger than them. One that belongs to and gives shape to the grotesque as a whole. And this is a kind of particularly good instance to see this, right? Each one of these things has particular quality and its own blurring. It's also though subsumed to a general pattern here. So for instance, those torso candelabra plants don't just taper into little ornamental loops as, as they do some time here. They also function as lines that provide axial orientation and frame the whole ungrounded mess of discrete stuff as both subdivided screen and ordered set of views. All of which is to say that these hybrids participate in constructing the form that subsumes them, right? That structures how they appear, that organizes the terms that appearance. They help produce their own abstraction, is what I'm getting towards here, right? They are the very unit that makes them also interchangeable, fundamentally fungible, subject to something that, that kind of eclipses them. Um, and in that way, they become open to analogy and open to exchange. Okay, um, nothing will be quite this sort of formalist from here out. Um, uh, but I want to give a kind of first pass towards the meaning of the kind of bigger arc I'm suggesting and why I think this matters beyond just my obsession with interior decoration in Europe in the 16th century, um, which is basically that the development of the category of the grotesque is not only a graphic mode, but also a conceptual category that we use to describe sort of varieties of experience. Um, following the reception first into Italy, then out across Europe and beyond, will be the history of a progressive dismissal of these second and third modes of blurring. And, and again, the second and third, by that I mean one that blurs between figurative and ornamental seamlessly, and this one between all of the elements as specific, but also all the elements as subsumed within an overall composition. These modes of imaging and the forms of thought I think they articulate uh, in, a, in, for me, a really powerful way, get slowly erased from the ambit of the grotesque in favor of a total focus on the first mode alone. On the idea of what I mentioned, I was calling the kind of figurative grotesque. 
um, that only reveals combinations of discernible objects. Above all, the human body with other things. It comes to like human body plus tree, human body plus vase, right? In that regard. Um, and as we're in a sort of philosophical context, I'll make a kind of detour here um, as to why I'm saying, saying figurative as opposed to kind of figural or representative. Um, in this, I'm drawing in the distinction that Leotard makes in, in Discourse Figure in 71, and that Deleuze, uh, you'd say, is a kind of operative and logic sensation a decade later. Um, so for Leotard, quote, the term figurative, figurative, uh, indicates the possibilities of deriving the pictural object from its real model through a continual translation. Figurativity is therefore a relative property, a relation with the plastic object it represents. It disappears if the picture no longer has the function of representing, if it is itself object, um, end quote. That's from Leotard. And for Deleuze, extending from this, the figurative is a quality of representation itself. It is, maybe more specifically, the illustrative and narrative character of representation, the aspect which, quote, implies the relationship of an image to an object that it is supposed to illustrate, end quote. That's from um, Logical Sensation. Um, it constructs an entire order of what he calls figurative thinking, in which, as a narrative and illustrative tendency, quote, a story always slips into, or tends to slip into, the space between two figures in order to animate the illustrated whole. Okay. However, the figure for Deleuze is not the unit of the figurative, but rather the block of sensations. It's kind of compound of percepts and affects that figurative thought tries to capture by means of providing this ordering mechanism between them. Okay, so to speak of the figurative grotesque in this is to stress the treatment of the figures within the work, not as sort of blocks of sensation, as sort of potentially indeterminate grotesque elements, but as correlates of plastic objects represented out in the world. And so the figurative grotesque will become nearly the entirety of what's meant by that term. It's the conception, for instance, that underwrites that argument from Connolly that I was beginning with. And taken in some, I think it's pretty obvious, but it's concerned with the caricatural, uncertain, monstrous, distorted, horrific, but comid, comic, hybrid status of things, right? Human subjects that are kind of messy in their corporeality, that look and act bestial bodies that leak and spurt and swell and morph, appetites that run amok, men that work like machines, robots that weak like men, et cetera, like this sort of ongoing set of that, um, all supposedly to reveal the laughable, unstable, and unwieldy urges that are never quite tamed by social responsibility. This, though, will come to supplant the possibility worked out in full um, by this other kind of wider mode of the grotesque, with these sort of three levels I'm suggesting kind of blurring and slipping in and out, uh, which could move from entity to pattern to structure and back again, a uh, kind of machine of condensation and hybridity. And that full mo mode po uh, points towards what I'm calling the sort of relative grotesque, which I won't get into as much, but I could sort of speak about it later, um, which is less a discrete content, it's less being like, oh, this other kind of content, but rather a method of attending to structural relations decoupled from structural relation, if not identity, with the represented, right? Um, and I think a kind of relative grotesque method uh, would attend to how even the explicitly bodily uh, is still enmeshed and entangled in layers of bodily list form and operations of abstraction. That would be the sort of hope of this, this shift away from that. Okay, to understand how that happens, um, let me go back through these, uh, would be kind of way, way, way beyond what I can do. Um, so I hope you'll sort of trust me when I said that these tendencies, I think, are born out in a far wider swath of research, I'm sort of only giving a few examples. What I'm gesturing to are tendencies that emerge when you look at like print after print after print and painting after painting, right? This is, there's a drift that begins happening. Okay, so what is that drift? When the Domus Aurea gets rediscovered, it does so as style. It's an available technique of repetition. It's like a remake from the start. And, it's, and it begins, therefore, this cross-historical mimicry evacuated of any contextual resonance from its discovered source. It's funny for me, deeply funny, that like the, the kind of interior decorations of the arch pervert of Rome end up in the Vatican with like no sense there may be something sort of ill at ease about this. Um, it gets painted over in part, um, Vasari of all people in, 19, in 1556 helps like whitewash them because they get the sense that we've gone too far and we should not have churches full of like unicorns fucking an octopus on top of a bunch of ribbons. Um, but nevertheless, it initially they just like phew, goes wild. Okay, so in that first period of historical repetition, there's two significant tendencies that emerge. One is just simply enough the dissemination of, of these grotesque, of these grotesques through Western and Central Europe, especially via, um, I'll show a brief example here, Aeneo Vico's uh, popular engravings uh, that were to come. These are sort of circulated as folio in a key way. 
Second, however, is a shift internal to the style of the grotesque, even as the imitations used actual elements in the Domus Aurea and preserved their basic subdivision of visual space. Okay, when you look at the, um, let's jump this back to here for a sec, sorry for the ordering. When we look at ones like this, Red is talking about, or any of these, um, there's a certain kind of airiness to the Domus Aurea ones they're borrowing from, right? There's kind of like a harmonious, breezy space, sometimes with an explicit architectural framing, in which the elements have a kind of plausible mass. They're shaded, there's kind of chiaroscuro, but in some sense, um, they remain dispersed and delicate. The shift you get towards the 16th century imitations is not one of structure or content per se. Um, this is a good instance to show this here but initially of heightened density and compression. You can already see it here. They're like cramming this stuff in. In part, why? Because they're basically making source books, right? They copy the illustrations. These get sent out. Someone else copies them somewhere. But one of the consequences, there's this dense kind of collapsing of that wider axial space into these dense hybrids. You can see this here as well, too. Sort of begins vanishing in some forms. Um, and these particularly dense ones, right, where things are just rammed up there. Um, the result is the production of these patent, painted or engraved fields where the manifold elements are no longer so strictly subsumed into a grid axial or architectural frame, instead become hard to untangle, even harder to fathom as a real space, right? It's just like they're condensed around the bodies. Um, and the work of, of Nicoletto de Modena, who's this one here, especially indicates this tendency because he reproduced exact elements from the Domus Aurea. He like borrows things out, but not the visual structure in which they're set. Right? So instead, his works place these elements in these dense, busy, and chaotic webs of foliage, humans, animals, furnishings. You start getting in a lot of these, um, these use of sort of ribbons that literally almost tie everything together. And so the consequence of the shift, which I think is really tricky, and, and um, apologies for this brief, but you get it, I think, sort of theorized in part by Andre Chastel in a really superlative um, account from 1988 of the grotesque. And for Chastel, this sort of period is marked by the co-presence of two fundamental tendencies. There's the negation of space, he says, that results in the weightlessness of forms. And there's the fusion of elements that generates a, quote, insolent proliferation of hybrids. This is sort of Chastel's account. Okay, what does he mean by this? I mean, it sounds nice. But um, I think it's best read in terms of reciprocal and mutually reinforcing negations. So first, the negation of space unbinds those elements from any grounding. The elements have thickness modeling, and especially in the next century, which I'll show, they come to suggest this tremendous like energetic fleshliness on their own. But they're undone from depth. They come to float entirely in a graphic space, which you can even see in some of these, especially if you sort of pull back, right? There's no sense of sort of staging. They just hover there. Um, and this isn't unique, you say that some of the Domus Aurea versions do this too, but the difference is that the, the Roman versions contribute to a sense of balance, and they're tethered to a design that determines the distribution of the elements, right? Which they themselves enact as a sort of material information. Um, they're both posed on, but also construct the linking elements themselves. Second, in these sort of later versions here, because the negation of space denies the elements depicted weight and mass, even while still depicting them as like, heavy things, those forms, the decorative and dividing elements, including the kind of figurative ones, lose any material particularity, even as they feel substantial. That's to say, they can't structure or restrain the proliferation that takes over. Um, and this extension further undoes the set of coordinates or distances that might allow for us to have like a cogent relation to the landscape or the space as a whole. It generates this surging recombinatory vitality, um, which comes to be staged in even more intense and explicit ways. You can sort of see these here. Um, particularly in ones like this, which I'll, I'll, you can see pretty well from here. Um, I'll zoom in, where what you begin having is literally the human form itself becomes the like sprout and sort of source of the kind of hybrid, um, let's say volatility. This is a particularly striking one here, right? Where like the axial frame is bursting from the head of the man here. That's the sort of heart of this. Um, so the overall consequence of this circuit of negation generation is, in some sense, a spatial quality unbound from spatial coherence. And the future of the grotesque as figurative grotesque, with all the kind of political consequences it entails, should be identified in precisely this early process, and then how it's critically interpreted and picked up by figures like Montaigne and others, right? Having negated space through both the traversal and chaotic ordering of space, it ceases to name a relation between parts, or between parts or total design, 
and it instead becomes increasingly excrescent and expanding quality within things, independent of the ordering systems they create and that condition them. And so I showed you some of the Dutch ones, but just to pass back, you can really see the increasing tendency towards once again kind of staging them as these sort of visible particular forms. This is coming out of the graphic version, the, the kind of purely flat graphic one. Once unbound and begin locating that vitality in the figures, the figures themselves begin reconstituting sort of space around them. They organize it literally as the sort of centrality of the, the living. Um, and so by, in some sense, interpreting the objects and bodies on display as freed from this material grounding, but still insisting that they're somehow like epistemologically dark and have this capacity to be these like eruptive repressed essence to show itself, the grotesque element becomes a discrete unit out of space, but structuring around it. Um, so within this, I'm going to kind of go quickly, but I want to get some of these remarkable things here, um, including this image, which is one of the singular images I've ever found by Aaron van Bolten, which as far as I can tell, it's two phalluses hugging and stabbing each other with swords at the same time. Um, this, this happened. Um, but the following centuries, I want to suggest, involve a, a set of shifts that develop this fundamental tendency, this negation of space, this relocation of kind of vital recombinatory force within thing them, things themselves, and then their re-entry into space, their re-entry into what looks like world. That's the kind of dialectic of the grotesque in this regard. And by the tail end of that, you can see emerging what became, I'm gonna, this one's distracting, we'll go back to this. Um, <laughs> I know, I know my audience. Uh, we'll leave this one here. So by the tail end of the process, you can see emerging what became the most constant element of succeeding notions, which is that the grotesque names the co-presence of the contradictory within single phenomena, and phenomena being overwhelmingly a single object or single entity, such that the grotesque marks the appearance of a supposed whole's split constitution. And there's tons of versions of this kind of emphasis, but the better known ones is like, the simultaneity of the horrific and comic, which is Wolfgang Kaiser's account of this, the, the fearful and the ludicrous in Ruskin, uh, in Harpum, quote, the normative, fully formed high or ideal with the abnormal, unformed, degenerate lower material. Uh, you get this also in traditions of the literary grotesque, right, which is like the figure who inspires both pity and revulsion. So in all of these, right, you can see that it comes to mark the co-presence of the supposedly exclusive within a thing, within a scene, but more than that, an entity. Now, roots of this are quite old in a number of ways, um, particularly in this notion that they're somehow against nature, or you're making a composition against nature. So in, in Horace's uh, account, interestingly, of like original Roman kind of grotesque, though not having the term, he says, suppose a painter starts from a human head, he joins it to a horse's neck, he inserts a variety of feathers on limbs assembled from anywhere and everywhere, and so, repulsively, a woman of appealing form above ends in a black fish. Odd one. Could you, my friends, refrain from laughter were you admitted to such a sight? You get earlier instances as well, something like Vitruvius's critique also of the sort of, of grotesque paintings before they were called that, turning his sights on decoration that commits for him a kind of mortal sin of employing, quote, monstrous forms which never existed, do not exist, and shall never come into being. It is a really, it's a fascinating critique if anyone wants to read Vitruvius on this, um, but quite fascinating. The notion became a powerful one in subsequent centuries, but not the way that Vitruvius hoped, because this becomes instead a rallying cry in defense of the grotesque's disruptive and morally inverting qualities, shifting from problems of decorative composition to content of kind of macabre fecundity routed through the human form. And this is taken up as a sort of aesthetic arm for waging critiques of moral and social composition at large, or in a less strident register as a sort of stylistic grounded mechanism for the desire to shock bourgeois sensibility, right? Um, as Frederick Berwick describes it, quote, what began as purely ornamental play soon became occasion for shocking as well as intriguing the viewer. The artist took the fantastic motifs of the human form wantonly blended with animality, urns and pillars rooting and vining, budding into male and female organs, all alive and fecund, though not infrequently punctuated by creeping vermin or scattered skeletal remains. So this move from ornamental play to shock tactic can be mapped onto the sort of three diverging paths taken by this. So first, there's the extension of individual elements, the grotesque, um, into kind of other techniques and styles. I mentioned in one sense most infamously the single figure. We would also here want to include, let's say, like the, um, the 18th century proliferation of the arabesque, um, which is sort of 
combining things drawn, some sense from Domus Aurea with sort of Islamic decorative art. Another crucially would be the, the sort of rokai, right, the sort of unit of the rococo, uh, using grotesque slippage between two-dimensional and three-dimensional space as a launching point for decorative flourishes that seem to have a kind of real or depicted mass or volume. Um, so this is one tendency. Second, as I said, there's the diffusion of the grotesco as that characteristic content focused on the bodies more and more explicitly in ones we have like this. So these are the 1630 to 1640 print folios of Arendt van Bolten, which are especially striking because they not only dis depict seriously grotesque hybrids like the sheep, man, phallus thing stabbing each other, but they also preserve elements that fuse bodies with decorative details. This is a particularly interesting one. Looming elements on the page, uh, you have in this one here, sort of float over the fighting genitals, while in other etchings like this one, they become carapaces armor and exoskeletons for the creature as though the monsters like climbed free from the wall to cheer on each other's sort of pretty impressively kinky displays of shaming um, in this case. There's a whole lot happening here. Um, but while this commitment to perviness is, is pretty unparalleled, Bolton really takes the cake for that, it's not unique in the way that it continues that complicated dialectical kind of passage, I guess, of negation and recuperation within the grotesque, because it comes to be sort of staged as just back into space in those freestanding figures, but also most strikingly, I think, um, oh yeah, this is a classic one. There's a whole lot of flatulence running through the history of the grotesque as well. Um, but where you can really sort of see the ground this takes on are, are these, um, these print works circulating in mid-18th century, which I'll just say like two minutes on, but I could speak about these for hours because I think they're really fascinating. One are the self-designated grotesques. He used the term to sort of talk about these. Um, by Giovanni Battisti Peronese, the sort of crucial um, figure of sort of some architectural pre-modernity. These are published in 1748, and they stage scenes of ancient Rome midway through processes of grotesque recuperation, such as this, which is what else? The tomb of Nero itself, interpenetrated by snakes, plants, and vines, as if the grotesque is no longer a graphic, fantastic mode, but has instead become a property and process latent in the world, all was barely fended off by our attempts to clean and divide. And I should, we should note that um, these immediately precede his more notorious Catari d'Invenzione, the invented prisons, uh, so important to Sergei Eisenstein, most others in Manfredo Tafori, um, which themselves enact a grotesque of architectural form, perhaps rediscovering their early impulse towards a structural determination and nightmare in the Domus Aurea, as the tiny figures here are lost amongst a space that is built for and around them in the kind of carceral mode, yet whose monstrous rationality exceeds their scale and duration. These are, um, again, very fascinating. I'd strongly recommend, if people are interested in, in, in Tafori's work in the sphere in the labyrinth on um, his reading of Pyrenees, is, is stunning. The other ones that I'll just mention um, are these wild bouts of displaced colonial anxiety by Filippo Morgan, uh, produced in the 1760s, titled Account of the Most Notable Things Seen by Sir Wild Skull in, and um, uh, Madame de Lejil in their famous voyage from the earth to the moon. So these are literally like moon scenes. They're sort of an early sort of sci-fi uh, with a kind of salvagey colonial anxiety here. Um, but the grotesque, again, has become landscape and world. There's a really interesting way where you see this sort of bleeding edge of the frontier that's marked sort of as seen is, again, a sort of rokai element that's now kind of bracketing mechanism for the edge of the world here. So in both cases, there's, I mean, they're, they're wild and nasty. Somehow, like, sort of um, class society has persisted onto the moon and this grotesque is very sad um, and you can see this sort of immense anxiety. So in both cases this fear of the importation of alien life, of commingled territories or of the surging primitive vitality not just of the body but now of the landscape itself this kind of creeping through the cracks of, empi of ex-empire is sort of manifestly present. It comes to rivet the grotesque. And I think it's no accident, too, that this is exactly the period I mentioned where particularly something like the Arabesque um, tends to acknowledge other histories of the grotesque by kicking it out of a model of kind of Western European history. It comes to be looking, it's like, not this, right? There's a sort of chinoiserie here where sort of ornament becomes plantation and waiting. I think there's a very particular sort of lurking kind of racial fear that has to do with this kicking out. Okay. Um, let me see how much time I'm going to go for, because I won't speak too long. Okay. Um, i got a couple minutes here, but let me, um, let me pass quickly through something, and then I'll, I'll try to be kind of quick about it there. Um, yeah, we'll leave these be for now. I'll just leave that up. So the third big path you could follow um, is the emergence of the grotesque as a concept 
distinct from plastic arts. And inklings of this appear well before its full development, such as the binding of pre-grotesque accumulation to symbolic language, like these sort of bestiary alphabets in the mid-15th century, or, for instance, uh, the rhetorical question Montaigne poses his own writing. And this is really fascinating when Montaigne is describing his own practice. This is one of the first uses of grotesque outside of the tradition of graphic arts. He says, what are these in truth other than grotesques and monstrous bodies pieced together from various members with no certain figure, having no order or, prop or proportion other than by chance? That's his definition of the essay, which for me is very fascinating. Um, we should note crucially for Montaigne, the grotesque is a quality of assemblage and relation. It's a disorder of composition rather than an, an innate quality. And as with much of his thinking, he's sort of well ahead of the curve, but the tenor of his reference, an analogy drawn between modes of artistic practice uh, and then in some sense a sort of floating philosophical category, points the path followed. Um, as Moshe Barash notes, by the 18th century, the grotesque genre and ornamental art had become essentially French. And that's what I said with the, the shift of the term arabesque. The key thing, as he says there, is that the word grotesque at that point becomes reserved for other spheres of thought. So there's a sort of having pulled off this strange sort of spatial dialectic of reassigning vitality and kind of metamorphic possibility within the body itself. The word now can kind of come undone from graphic arts there. Um, so very quickly, in the same century, the meaning of the word, at least in printed record, shifted to emphasize now distortion, right, torsion, a sort of torquing. Uh, Nathan Bailey's A Universal Etymological Dictionary from 1700, the grotesque now means distorted or caricature. In the 1771 German-French Dictionary, figuratively speaking, grotesque means odd, unnatural, bizarre, strange, funny, ridiculous, caricatural, etc. And the sense of anti-nature gets pushed all the more in a stance to be defended or attacked, uh, particularly by the German romantics, for whom the grotesque is uniquely capable of accessing liminal modes of experience. Um, it goes on from there. I, we could talk about sort of Christoph Martin Weiland and then Flogel's sort of work on um, on the sort of passage out of there. Uh, for sake of time, and I can return to some of this, but I want to maybe just um, in some sense suggest the, the overall drift that I was sort of pushing towards. And we can come back if need be to, to Ruskin, Kaiser, and Bakhtin, who sort of crystallized these modes with different degrees of emphasis on if grotesque can uniquely access, let's say, concepts beyond rationality. Or, uh, But the relevant thing I'd say in all of their works is how what you never can get away from by their remarkable theorizations, particularly Bakhtin's account of sort of um, French Renaissance sort of carnivalesque modes and obscene laughter, is again this sense that the grotesque now lives inside single forms rather than taking shape also in how they are determined by a world that exceeds them. Even in the most radical theories, this remains now. It's a kind of transgressive, monstrous, potentially queer sort of force in the body itself that maybe contains multitudes, but is always there like latent and waiting. Okay, so what I want to sort of say on the basis of all this, to, to just to sort of say why I think this matters, basically, um, is that the grotesque, and by that I mean the drift of it, I mean the loss of its original breadth and the passage into narrowed form, should be understood, I'd argue, as precursive of the problems of visibility, manifest violence, abstraction, penalty, and structuration that's central also to the development of capital as a total social form. That's to say that the meaning of the grotesque, transgressive and corruptive as it hopes to be, itself becomes subject to the same discipline at the core of the formation of capitalist forms of life. And there's a number of ways you could do this, but one of them I've already dwelt on, which is the obsessive focus on the single energetic body, right, in some sense. You could think also of the, the dislocation of uh, Helmholtz's account of Kraft to as appears as labor power in Marx, a sort of universal energy comes to be held in a sort of single figure again and again. I also think there's a, an interesting way if we take an account of someone like, like Federici or others who've worked on the, the history of sort of gendered punishment and disciplining in the years prior to the sort of full emergence of the capitalist world system. Uh, what you have there is a sort of severing of forms of knowledge about how to adequately navigate the world from those themselves considered grotesque, considered shapeshifters, right? Like the figure of the witch is sort of central in this, the sort of cutting of that out towards a body that is what? Defined by its capacity to have what Marx calls that form-giving fire, right? That itself becomes a sort of vital element of that. Second, though, if we're to seek rebellious solace then in the image of the grotesque body, we'd also have to recognize that, as I'm suggesting, capitalism will itself pose the individual human body. For Federici, quote, the human body is the first machine developed by capitalism, and its capacity to transform materials in the world as the primary unit for capital, for work, 
for representational politics, for state biometrics, that comes to be coalesced in the dual forms of the worker and the savage, the citizen and the slave. And I'm pairing them in this way because the operative distinctions uh, within capitalist discipline, I'd say particularly in the 18th and 19th century, was not free work as opposed to forced work, but the correctly mobilized energy of free wage labor as opposed to the restless indolence of the uncivilized. You can see this, for instance, um, in the development of late 19th century criminal uh, anthropology by those such as Lombroso. They have these invented categories, what they call like aurora laboris, the horror of work, which sort of supposedly marks this sort of like restless vitality of those who have not been brought into industry. That for them is a sort of civilizational dividing line. And as for the second pairing, which we, I think we've all, it's been sort of present in discussions, particularly in the work of some like, like Wilderson, um, I think you can see the sort of energy of the grotesque operating in both. On the one hand, the sort of citizen is the fundamental political unit of supposed free choice, who might rise the level of leader, but is threatened by that slip into grotesquery, right? The mask kind of comes off in some regard. Uh, and I would also put alongside this, this sort of terror, the, the bourgeois terror of the proletarian mob becomes really key. This sort of swarm and those who lose individuation, who sort of tip towards this form of what something like in Klaus Tevelite's um, male fantasies really brilliantly details as an image of kind of subjective liquidity, a sort of diffuse rage, as opposed to the, the fascist body, which is imagined to be carapaced and always individual, always containing the liquid. It never leaks. That's this whole, like fascist bodies aren't supposed to leak in some regard. Um, in some sense, though, there's still a kind of positivity as sort of an account of historical dynamism and transformation that lies in the idea of the sort of citizen become rebel, become sort of mass mob, which lacks entirely that positivity in the wings of kind of racial terror, even as it shares the same dislocation of historical transformation into the body's capacity. Um, which is to say that, amongst many other things, the invention of blackness as a category, this materially constructed by terror and extraction, serves not only to create an alleged racial identity, but to insist that the qualities are carried in the body itself. I think your point about the shift to the anatomical is absolutely key for this, right? It's, it, blackness comes to be seen as, as um, inextricable, kind of carried simply within the body. Um, so insofar as black life gets coded as both existential necessity for civil society, but also existential threat in some regard, this is a sort of vision of the grotesque that's always like haunting on that edge, necessary and containable, but always threatening right towards the sort of insurrection that'll take revenge against white society. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll just say two sentences sort of off the, the cuff um, to a degree here because I wanna sort of wrap up so we've got time to talk. Um, but to say basically that I think the concept of the grotesque, as I've been suggesting, rightly celebrates this body as transgressive, uh, monstrously uncertain and non-normative, but the problem you can see in this drift is how it insists on the rebel body, on single units of this in some regard. It shares that same winnowing of kind of possible interaction to a single kind of individual form. And in that regard, I think kind of aesthetic tendencies towards the grotesque, especially now, endlessly reconfirm the very category they wish to trouble, right? Um, and I think this is especially kind of perverse in a way because the predominant social s system that does emerge in this arc I'm talking about in the passage of, say, towards like the 18th and 19th, 20th century, that of capital pioneers a form of relative enmeshing between not just similar things, not just the process of exchange kind of caught in a frozen moment, but also asubjective and inhuman patterns, processes, techniques, and forms through which activities are subsumed and transformed to accord with their own abstraction. And this will come to be not just a, a real lived experience with no precedent in the history of the species. I think that the encounters people have with factory work has, has no precedence, and I've written increasingly a lot on the way that uh, women working in early textile factories describe their own experience of uh, being subsumed into machinic assemblages. This also comes to be one of the most crucial dynamics in the development of capital as world system. That's to say, subsumption as historical passage, right, from formal subsumption of labor to real subsumption. So, more generally, we could say that capital doesn't have grotesque elements, even if its ambit includes like wear robots and leaky bodies and things that shapeshift. Rather, capital in some sense is the world made grotesque, having left behind a drippy underground palace to become the sort of contours of possible experience. And what this means is that by the time this system of capital begins to construct the organization of human life on its own terms, uh, in what Jacques Camat calls the community of capital, then by that moment, this one particular form, the grotesque in its early mode, that could give images to, mo image, excuse me, to modes and processes of subsumption in and out of pattern, of abstraction and structure, has been lost. Um, so I'll end there with the sort of 
you know, I think gesture towards the question is what would it be to rediscover a sort of adequate mode of the grotesque that could in fact see this sort of um, sort of structural levels of determinate interpenetration. But I'll end there.